Hello, David Zeritsky from the Bond Experience. I know this visually looks a little bit different, but we're doing something different today. You've been a part of our influencer discussions that we're doing. There's a lot of individuals that are very influential in the Bond community, and I'm with two of my favorite right now who um, I would say, I, I almost hate to use this vernacular, they are hot, hot, hot. More popular now than ever. I'm going to make them really embarrassed for some compliments <laughs> to begin with. But I've become addicted to something. Yes, it's not the good old heroin anymore. No, kicked it. It is uh, JBR. It's James Bond Radio. And I want to welcome uh, Tom Sears and Chris Wright to uh, the Bond Experience. Welcome, gents. Hey, man. Wow. That, what a lovely welcome. That was very kind of you. Thank I you. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Think, I, don't, I don't think we've ever had one quite like that, have we, Tom? No. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, definitely this is a special all, really This right. is all about first. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, so, nice. so I'll tell you what we've been doing. We've been really, this is about getting to know some of the individuals that are really having an impact. And, you know, guys, I get it. I mean, humbleness aside, um, I think your reach right now has is, is pretty impactful. Uh, we had just come back, as you know, from uh, both Solden and Pitts Gloria, uh, two major Bond events. And we were talking with uh, people within PR, uh, as well as fans, and your names constantly come up. Oh, really? That's so, cool. you know, That's nice it is cool. Hear. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard in your own head to really wrap yourself around the amount of people that you touch entertain and enhance, but we want to get to know you a little bit better today. So we're going to start off um, and you let me know who wants to take this, but how did the two of you find each other? It's a very it was romantic a story. Site, wasn't it, yeah. Tom? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was in the, in the pre-Tinder days we, we swiped. Um, no, it was, uh, it was at the uh, Ian Fleming Centenary uh, Celebration at the London Palladium. So that would have been 2008, just before Quantum of Solace came out. And we didn't know each other at all. And I went along to that show and we were just absolutely randomly by luck seated next to each other and uh, and got chatting and stuff. And the, the, the thing that made me go, this dude really likes Bond. Because you know when you meet somebody who's a Bond fan and they think, yeah, I like Bond. And you go, how much do you like Bond? You, like, do you just like the films or whatever? Or like, do you go deep on it? And they were showing a small clip of Quantum of Solace. Like I say that, yeah, it wasn't out yet. And and it was, you know, an exclusive that was just for this show. And it was the sequence um, with uh, strawberry fields on the bed covered in oil. And so I'm there like eyes wide open, like really excited to see this clip. And then Chris has literally got his thumbs in his ears and his fingers over his eyeballs. And he's rocking backwards and forwards and like humming to himself and singing because he, he didn't want anything. He didn't want to know a thing before he went into the show. And I remember looking at him thinking, damn, this dude, this dude goes for it, you know? And that was, that was it really. We just got chatting from there. And, and, and even after that, you still wanted to be my friend. Didn't you, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. I got it. I got, I got the feelings, man. I knew, I knew that yeah. you went as deep as I did, or maybe even deeper. Yeah. And it was quite good. Then basically, I think we exchanged sort of uh, email addresses or Facebook and kept in touch. And we always say on the show, there's a release valve that you have with Bond. And if you don't get that chance, like I'm sure yourself with the Bond experience, if you don't get that chance to just sort of get it out there, it, it sort of it doesn't make you feel well. You need, you need, you need that sort of uh, release valve. You need to get your love for bond out there. And, um, and Tommy came up with this idea of doing a podcast one day and we were like, Oh, okay. Well, I, in fact, I think I, my first reply was, Oh, so it was a podcast. Yeah, and then I, I obviously your response, yeah. your response was, yeah, all right. What, what's a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the and, release uh, is yeah, so vital. Concept. You're right. It's almost because a lot of people will ask me, as I'm sure they ask you, hey, is this your full time gig? And I explained to them that this is so much cheaper than therapy or drugs. Mm. Um, I do it because I love it. If somebody happens to like it on the other end, it's almost a bonus. Mm. But I think you guys, I can I can really feel the authenticity that you guys are just genuinely having a good time. Yeah, you try to, don't we? Try. Yeah, I think that's what it all boils down to. Because for years, like, so that was 2018. We started a podcast in 2013, I think. So we've been, yeah, coming up five years, I guess. And then um, mm. for, for in that time, we were just messaging each other on Facebook and do, playing the stupid games we play on the podcast just via instant message, you know, being like, oh, who said this in what film, blah, 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 and doing these stupid little games. And yeah, so it was, it was, yeah, that it totally is something we'd have done anyway, even before the podcast even came up as a thing. That's fantastic. Fantastic. So um, 
I was thinking about asking you, you know, how did you become a Bond fan? But I'm going to be I'm going to be very frank with you. Kind of the world knows because you've all talked about your passion, which movies you saw first. And so I'm going to actually turn it a little bit. This is a wonderful community of Bond fans, but there are things that irk people, whether it's infighting or maybe it's even, you know, uh, how the fans are treated in general. But and we'll take it one at a time. And maybe, Chris, you go first. But what are some of yeah. those things that irk you a little bit about Bond fandom? Well, I think the fact is you get a lot of hate out there. Um, you know, haters are going to hate. And what I don't understand, and, and Tom and I reference this quite a lot, actually, is if someone is a fan of something, it means that they're into it. It means they enjoy it. It means that they want to go home and listen to something or watch something because, you know, it's part of them and it's what they really like doing. And I think for the three of us, we can safely say Bond, definitely. But there seems to be sort of Bond fan, maybe not communities, but there'll be certain people perhaps or, or certain forums where it just seems to be people slagging off Bond, whether it's one of the actors or one of the films. And and what really, I mean, that, you know, everyone's free to their own opinion and that's fair enough. But the two things that I think irk me the most are the fact that you have this hate community, which is out there. And it's not big compared to like, obviously, a proper Bond fans, but it is there. But it's also when people shut other people down for having an opinion. So, you know, there are certain films, just, just to sort of say maybe Diamonds, maybe A View to a Kill, where maybe Quantum, you know, um, maybe Spectre, where people sort of really diss on it and, and, and have a massive go at this sort of film. But yet someone out there, it's their favourite film. And, and why should why should someone else's opinion be any better than anyone else's, you know? We're all in the game together and everyone, the fact that everyone likes their own Bond film that's different, that's what's beautiful about Bond and about the Bond fans. So, yeah, I think when people don't let other people have an opinion, I think that's when, you know, it sort of gets my sort of skin up a little bit, I think. Yeah. That's great. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, you've, I couldn't put it any better. I think that's the key thing. I think it's it, if you love something, why on earth would you spend all day slagging it off and slating it? I mean, there's some communities and stuff online where it's just like bashing Brosnan for this, that or the other or bashing Roger or something. And it's kind of like, if you're a fan of something, why why would you just look for the bad things that you don't personally like? And there's so much, this Bond means so many different things to different people. I think that that's part of the beauty of it. You know, for, for some people, the cold Timothy Dalton, you know, Ian Fleming to the bone kind of thing is exactly what they want. Whereas, you know, for me, I'll happily take an underwater submarine Lotus Esprit Turbo or even a trip into outer space. Do you know what I mean? I feel like those are equally valid in totally different ways and you would... It just depends what mood you're in at the time. For me, anyway, whether I, you know, want to watch Roger driving around in a submarine or or or, any, or watching Casino Royale or something. But yeah, I think ultimately it's, it's making everybody feel welcome to express an opinion. Somebody comes in and says Moonrake is their favourite Bond. There's a certain type of Bond fan who would be like, "Well, you're not a real fan then." And it's that just to me is like not what it's all about. You know, I, I think it's just like Chris said, allow people to have their opinions and celebrate those things. And one of the things we do on the, podcast i guess is we took like even with the films that we're less keen on we talk and explore the stuff the good parts of that rather than and acknowledge the things that maybe didn't work as well but not to dwell on that because i feel like you know we've all met bond fans at parties and stuff and they lead in with what they hate and immediately like just a bit of me dies on the inside and i'm just like really <laughs> can't you just you know what i mean let's not do that let's talk about something fun and exciting rather than your personal sounding board for what you hate you know <laughs> Yeah. I can't help but feel when I meet people like that, that they're like that in their everyday mm. life. I mean, they, mm. how many times have you heard somebody just go in that Debbie Downer and starts with the negative? And I mean, I, I've made a conscious decision. You probably have as well to try to not surround myself with those people. Yeah. But I do yeah. with Bond fans. It is the strangest thing. It's, it, I mean, you get those things of how could you possibly spend money on that to how could you collect props to how could you collect clothing or how could you wear clothing or how could you like Roger Moore? He's so campy. And, and I'm thinking yeah. like, you guys know we're all under the same umbrella of geekdom. Like, yeah. can we just embrace it? Yeah. It's bizarre. To yeah, me. totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So this is a big one and you're going to have to take humble pie and push it aside and say, mm. um, you know, you're a global entity. So let's not even question that. On a weekly basis, sometimes more than a weekly basis, you're connecting with people globally, whether they're driving their cars in Pennsylvania or reaching them in Timbuktu. 
you're reaching them globally. Do you ever stop and think about that, about your reach? And what does that mean to you that you are touching a global audience? And Tom, why don't we start with you? I suppose, yeah, I suppose the thing for us when we first started, because it was, like you said before, it's something we would have just talked about anyway. And we thought, why don't we just record some conversations and make a podcast? And it was very quickly that just randomly uh, the podcast was featured on the front page of iTunes. So you click onto iTunes podcasts and look on TV and film, or even on sometimes it was on the actual main page, you'd see the JBR logo up there and it was just totally out of the blue and stroke of luck, I guess. I don't even know how that happened. And then all of a sudden loads of people started listening reasonably quickly when we first started. It was probably like the second or third episode. And, uh, and yeah, and it was it was really strange because I remember saying like I feel if ten people tune in, it'll be like at least somebody's listening, and it'll be a laugh kind of thing, just a nice little hobby. Um, but I think ultimately the the time I felt it the most was was when uh, Sir Roger died, and basically we did this sort of commemorative episode, and set, we do this thing every now and then with the films where people can phone in and leave a voicemail to review the films or whatever, like a 90 second voicemail. So everybody gets to have their say on what they thought of that particular film. So we thought this time, like send us what your favorite memory of Sir Roger is or your, your favorite thing. And just the whole thing went absolutely crazy. And there were so many messages. I think we had over three and a half hours of 90 second messages of just people pouring their hearts out. And we had, we had guys on there who were like, they, they, I remember one guy who was reading a poem that Sir Roger had read at some point and he started to break down in tears halfway through and all that kind of stuff. And that really brings it home of, of what like a shared experience of something that you all love does to people. And when you listen to it, it's like, I remember somebody, the first ever time we did that was when uh, Spectre came out and everybody was doing their Spectre reviews. And uh, I forget who it was now, but they said their favorite uh, thing was uh, basically here in the United Nations of Bond. It was just like people calling in from New Zealand, Australia, or America, all over the place. And uh, how cool that was. So yeah, it's, it's those kinds of things when, when you hit, you have that kind of shared experience, I guess. Yeah. I, I remember one time um, we were looking at some of the sort of analytics of our listenerships around the world. And, and I think, Tom, you set this up. So you get like a global map and there's and there's um, it, it shows you where all the downloads have come from or the views have come from. And I think the first time I saw that, I was a bit sort of, you know, I, I it, t- it took me back a little bit just because we were seeing sort of people all over in random countries that, that we didn't even know you know, not even English speaking countries, some of them that, that we had listeners that we didn't even know about. And, uh, and that sort of struck me a little bit, which was really good. But I think the longer we've gone on, the more sort of ex- it's expanded and the more people sort of, um, will leave voicemails, like Tom said, and, and, um, we, we'll just get new names of, of people that sort of, uh, contact us on a regular basis. And it's really nice. And I think, there was something that we did recently with, um, or not recently, but when when Spectre, the actual title was released, and uh, and Tom did this sort of live show where the title was revealed and it was live, sort of uh, almost like FaceTiming, but with everyone, all the sort of fan community that could watch at the same time, and we had a lot of people viewing them, and uh, and I think we're going to try and do something similar for Bond Twenty Five as well if we can, and, yeah. and try and get as many people involved. Yeah, I think that was the first real experience of that because it was obviously the the sort of press conference for Spectre where they were going to reveal the title of the film and all that kind of stuff. And I was over in Thailand at the time in a hotel watching it and we basically embedded the live feed from YouTube on to a, uh, the page on the website and then there was like a chat box underneath. So everybody was tuning in from all over watching it on the same page as us and giving their thoughts. And it was just like that, that for me was a really cool moment because it was like sharing the excitement and just like the reveal of it being Spectre after all these years as well was such a, a, a cool moment, you know? I think, I think I have to admit for, for me, the two moments that made me say, ah, oh, JBR, it is really global. Two things. First of all, the vernacular that you use, like Belter. <laughs> I've accepted Belter in my everyday American. That instance. really pleases now, me. People don't know what the hell I'm saying. That's all right, Belter. And they're like, <laughs> um, but but the other thing is, um, recently I just heard the maybe even yesterday I heard the license to kill uh, when people called in with their uh, ninety seconds, mm-hmm. and just to hear all the different accents and voices and places and things like, and it kept going on and on, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like 
a global phenomenon. It's phenomenal. Yeah. 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 It's, it's really nice to to have that sort of um, scope in terms of getting people from all over. That's what, I mean, ultimately, although we didn't know it, that's what the podcast has been set up for. It's, it's, not, it's, it's Tom and I chatting, like we said, we'd do it anyway, even if we didn't have the podcast. So without knowing it, that is basically the main thrust of the podcast is to create these communities and and basically get Bond fans to integrate with one another. Um, and that's happened so much through podcast in terms of people even um, who, who listen to the podcast but have set up groups in different areas, be that in the US or in UK or elsewhere in the world or Australia or wherever. And then that's a chance for people, um, fellow Bond fans, to meet up, watch a film, go to locations, have a drink, just have a chat. and there didn't seem to be anything like that previously. And there are so many people who, who, who we've heard say to us or message, message us saying, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I really thought I was the only Bond fan in the whole world. But this is, this has been really nice for people to sort of have that chance to just find fellow Bond aficionados. And uh, yeah, that's probably the best thing for me that's kind of come out of it, I think, or at least one of the best things. It's a great point because to me, it's a global. Okay, it's a global affirmation of what you're doing and what you're interested in is not only perfectly fine, it's the normal amongst these wonderful people. Mm. And and I do want to bring up a point that JBR has moved off of the podcast to now events, whether you are there or not anymore, and even regions. So I know that, uh, for example, I think I'm part of the Mid-Atlantic. I haven't showed up to one of them yet, but damn it, I will. Um, but it's, you've motivated people to say, you know something, if Tom and Chris can chat together, why can't we create microcosms of this all over the world? So it's a great job. Definitely. All right. What was that point, and there usually is a point, when you realized that you and JBR were influencing people? And it, it, beyond even just the reach of it being global, but that people were like, oh, you know, I, I'll i tell you, for example, and let me, as you're, as you're thinking about this, for me, I have to tell you guys, and it's hard to convince me of things. I actually rethought License to Kill again. And I'm like, that was Miami Vice, damn it. I, I can never put on a Timothy Dalton film. And I went back and watched it because of the the very compelling conversations and what was great and what wasn't and the cue scene and the, the trucks and everything like that. So you you do influence the thinking and the motivation and the excitement of Bond fans. But was there a moment where this really came into light? And and Chris, we're going to start with you. Yeah. I do, do you know what? In terms of an actual moment, that might be quite tricky. Nothing jumps out. But what I, I do love and I do enjoy is when we get messages from people saying that we've reignited their love for Bond. So a lot of the time... When they were young, they were into it. It's normally the dad, you know, or some sort of family member that, that they'd watch the bond with, and that's how they got into it. But but they'd get into their teens or their twenties, and it'd kind of fall away. And we have people all ages, you, you know, from from teenagers right through to people in the sixties, seventies who listen. And if if they haven't if they haven't had bond in their life for a while, and they listen to an episode and then come back and say, you know what, this has really reignited my love for Bond or for a particular film, like you say, with License to Kill, who that, which they might have, you know, not bothered watching because they've got some sort of thought in their head where they don't like it. But yet they've kind of re-surmised it after listening to an episode and then watched it again. That's amazing. That's such a good feeling. Um, so for me, that that's probably another one of the best things about it. In terms of an actual point that I, that suddenly hit me, I'm not quite sure. Tom, do you, is, there any, is there any sort of particular point you can think of? Yeah, or? I do. There, there was, um, I remember when it happened to me when I changed my own mind about something. And then uh, from the podcast, and it, it, before that happened, though, it was uh, when we reviewed Majesties. So we were early on, obviously, going through all the films. And then we got to On a Majesty Secret Service. And it was one of those things where there's a couple of films throughout that typically among certain people have a bad reputation. So Majesties, you know, there's that old myth that George only did one because he wasn't very good. Like that's a lot of people think that, you know, if they're not hardcore into, into Bond. Um, or, you know, the, the Moonraker was the butt of everybody's jokes for a long time and all that kind of stuff. And I remember when we reviewed Majesties, and obviously it's both of our favourite films, so we were very, very enthusiastic. And I remember a lot of people saying, you know what, I never really gave that film a chance because it was George. And I, I've always thought I would, it would have been a great film had Sean done it. Um, 
And I think we even said that in the review that like that most people have like a what if, you know, what if you could change one thing about Bond, what would it be? And it's typically they'd put Sean in majesties for a lot of people. And my version of that was I would have, I, the other way around, I wish George had done Diamonds Are Forever and followed that line. I, I'd much rather see that than see Sean in Majesties. Um, so it was, it was seeing people, that was the first time people really, because I feel like everyone's in agreement on every film up into Majesties. Everybody loves Dr. No, Goldfinger and all the rest of it. When you get to Majesties, that's where things start to divide. And that was where people were like, you know what, I've I've gone back and I've looked at it in fresh eyes. Not everybody said that, but you know, a lot of people did, and and have got a lot more enjoyment out of it. And for me, I remember back in the day when I was growing up collecting my VHS tapes. It was I always thought, you know, Moonraker being the butt of everybody's jokes. That was just like the popular opinion. And then when we revisited it with the podcast, I was like, actually, this is really good. I mean, I know it goes a bit crazy at the end with the, with the space lasers and stuff, but as a as a Bond film, until that point, it's pretty solid. So yeah, that was that was my personal sort of transformation where where just yeah. the podcast influenced me. <laughs> in, in fact, it was so good that was your film of choice for your birthday this year, wasn't it? It Tom? was. It was indeed. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Pretty good. So yeah. let's let's keep on that theme of influence, but we're going to turn it a little bit. And I'm gonna I'm gonna actually going to start this next question with a quote from a, a movie that you should recognize. It's not a Bond one, so sorry. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. And I'll tell you a quick story about what I'm talking about. Um, years ago with Quantum of Solace, I had thought that I recognized a particular pair of sunglasses when the trailer came out. And I said, everybody, oh my gosh, it's Oliver Peoples, Airmen. Everybody go out and buy that. And I'm not exaggerating. I think hundreds of Airmen, Oliver Peoples with amber lenses were sold. Only to find out, of course, it was Tom Ford. Um, nobody complained. Everybody loves their errands. I still wear it today, but it really, it was the first time I ever sat back in 2008 and said, dude, you got to be careful. Like, yeah. you know, what you say is going to influence people sometimes even in spending money or doing things or believing things that if you haven't checked it may not be true. Do you ever before you get on a podcast or post something online or talk about a rumor or speculation, stop for a moment and go, crap, you know, what could I start? Or would that actually start to filter you? Would we get a different version of Tom and Chris? Well, well I, I, we'd never get anything wrong, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's, uh, it's, uh, it, we live in a, in a, in a, in a time where people seem to be a lot more sensitive these days to how they've ever been in history. So I, I, I suppose there's, there is that worry in the back of your mind that you might say something that somebody's going to freak out over. Um, but then at the same time, I think unless you're being your authentic self and you're just, you know, having those same conversations you'd have down the pub, then you would definitely lose something. So we, we tend to kind of plow ahead anyway and, and just hope for the best but i i do that i mean that is a thing I, with some other podcasts there's a, a lot going on in the star wars world these days with fans freaking out over the last jedi and there's been all sort there have been like podcast wars going on where some star wars podcasts are like warring against the other ones and trying to mess with their advertisers and all that kind of stuff and it's just like hold on a minute this is totally absolutely not what you should be doing. You're supposed to be celebrating. You're supposed to all be fans of the same thing. So what are you doing? And it's like picking holes in somebody, something said in episode 25 and that they don't agree with that politically and all this kind of nonsense. So it does happen. But I think ultimately, if that ever was something that was to happen, you just have to kind of ignore it. There's always going to be somebody that thinks what you've said is, is wrong or distasteful or not to their way of thinking. And I think you just have to plow on and just not worry about it. That's my take anyway. Yeah. I th yeah, no, I, I agree on that. And in in terms of sort of getting things wrong, when you when you're putting out, you know, however many podcasts a year, or, or you know, material um, for people to listen to or watch, it's inevitable that there are going to be a couple of things that slip in there that you just can't. You know, if if you fact check absolutely everything, we wouldn't have lives. We, we'd we'd you know, and and I'm sure it's the same with, with yourself. It it takes time to do what we do. Um, and, and you've just got to do it to the best of your ability with what you can. And if something, you know, isn't quite right, then, you know, so, so be it. It happens. And sometimes we'll get messages from people saying, you're well wrong about this. It was in here, not there. And you're just like, you take it on the chin, don't you? It is what it is. And like, obviously, 
Um, they always have and, that and voice we, too, don't they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> that's that's they what they all sound their... like. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you knew. Why have they always got their voice? But in terms of sort of influence people, in terms of t- to potentially buy stuff, if we've read a book, a Bond book that we think, great, you know, we really like this, more than happy to sort of mention that. Um, likewise, if there's been any uh, potential Bond accessory or any and anything that we've tried that's Bond related that we know that we like and enjoy and we've actually physically touched or read or watched or, or, or had a hands-on experience, so to speak, then we're obviously happy to put that forward. Um, and why not? You know, if, if we enjoy it, then we're assuming that people who are Bond fans will get equal enjoyment out of it as well. I, I purchased the Die Another Day extended uh, soundtrack because of your oh, podcast, well, as a matter of fact. There we go. Yeah. Played in my car all the time. But, you know, it's a good point because I know for me, I cannot walk on eggshells. I find that it's stilted. And, and like you, I don't script anything. I have a couple of notes in my head or notes on a piece of paper. But um, the authenticity comes through. And when you start to, like for a long time, people were, this was charming. That same guy that talks like this was correcting my pronunciations on Daniel Craig. Uh, Craig, yeah. Craig, <laughs> Krug. And so now, if you, now and then you'll see my vlog, I actually just call it right out. I'm like, yeah. I don't know, whatever the fuck you call it, you know, <laughs> Craig Crocker. Uh, but you, know, you need to embrace those mistakes as yeah. well. Yeah. Totally. But also, it's not necessarily mistakes. If people have different sort of, uh, accents or take take on words that's not necessarily a mistake is it it's just where people potentially come from perhaps although tom although tom did say he doesn't like the way that you say craig <laughs> I'm, <laughs> <laughs> joking. I'm sorry we're, we're disconnecting now <laughs> chris you bastard you're <laughs> no, you know it's great i think you just ultimately have to do that because it's that whole thing that ancient thing that you can't please everybody all the time and there's always yeah. going to be somebody out there that doesn't like just somebody just doesn't like your face for whatever reason and they're just gonna just get the, i mean do you remember that well I've got to throw this in there. We interviewed Sir Roger Moore once upon a time, and it was like the ultimate moment for the podcast. And it was it was just fantastic. And it was a dream come true moment. And so obviously we upload the episode and everything's going crazy for a few, for a few days. And uh, we posted it on Reddit, which if you didn't know is for anybody listening, it's you know like basically a gigantic forum with all sorts of different topics. So I posted it to the James Bond Reddit and this guy responded saying, basically that he hated me and Chris. <laughs> <laughs> he just hated our faces and that we were so unprofessional and awful. And what we should have done is copied down the answers from Sir Roger and just posted them on a forum somewhere because we were just trying to hog the limelight and, and like basically become famous off, off the back of Sir Roger. I was like, Jesus, how do you get to that? Do you know what I mean? I and know. it's just ultimately, it's just one of those things that you just have to laugh at because it's like that dude is obviously having a really bad day or Ultimately, yeah. maybe he's just having a really bad life. So it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, he's got it. He's got, you would never dream of making a post like that on somebody else, who, you know, on, on, a, on an, another person's post. So he's obviously, you know, not in, the, in that sort of positive frame of mind. So you just let him get on with it at the end of the day. But yeah, you, you just got to be yourself at the end of the day. And if that pisses anybody off, then so be it. Yeah, they can. So be, it makes it more can, interesting. Well, exactly. People can always stop listening or stop watching if they don't want to. Mm. So you know, it's everyone's got their choice, and you just keep doing what you want to do. I guess, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so yeah. let let's segue from people liking or not liking your faces to people that you talk about, you may or may not have a connection with. So um, I want to talk about the powers that be. What yes. I mean by that is Eon. So you um, I, you have actually a very charming way of referencing, you know, Barber, Babs, you know, in your conversations as if she's sitting behind you on the bed, which is great. Thanks, um, <laughs> but <laughs> but if, we, if we took it to a next level, and this is a little bit of a magic wand moment. And by the way, we, we've done this with every influencer and everybody gives some very different am- answers. But if you could take JBR and get a meeting with Barbara Broccoli and the marketing group at Eon and the PR people at Eon and say, you know something, we would love to take this to the next level. We certainly never want to be shackled uh, to be kind of a corporate entity. I think people love who we are as an authenticity, but we'd love to be more properly or officially associated with the Eon engine. What would that look like? What possibly could it look like? And would you even want it? Go on, Tom, you lead on this one. Uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah no i th- ultimately yeah it's it's a tricky one that because I, I know that a lot of movie companies like that some of them kind of keep the fan side of things at arm's length a little bit others are more embracing of it and i know that the whole star wars community with all the stuff going on in that at the moment up until recent times has been very accepting of the fans so you've got the huge conventions and stuff and and you know a lot of the the star wars podcasts are listed out on the official like lucasfilm star wars website and stuff and there's there's very much more an accepting of the fan community which you don't get so much from eon um but on the other side of that it is a different beast isn't it because eon are literally a family-run business compared to a huge disney massive thing um so how would it be i mean how would it, how would that look i suppose the the ultimate dream would be to get the phone call and say you know we're shooting at pinewood on sunday do you want to come along and visit the set and have a chat with daniel i mean that would be the dream come true wouldn't it i guess um but then Definitely. i i see why that doesn't happen and i i looking at all the stuff leading up to spectre you know daniel did that interview on the nerdist network and stuff and it's like I guess they assume they already know all of the people that are going to listen to JBR or the Bond experience. All of those people are 100% going to go and watch the film anyway. So it's kind of like if you go for those sort of like gen- general nerdy podcasts where maybe Marvel is the, the typical kind of thing or, or whatever, or sci-fi or something, you could potentially get some people that wouldn't ordinarily go and see Bond, go and see it. So I, I see why they don't. But yeah, I, I think for me it would be, you know, set visits, more more of an inclusive sort of fan experience, but I kind of get why they don't at the same time. So for me, I think there's a lot that they could definitely do in terms of reaching out to the fans. And I don't mean that on an individual basis. In terms of the podcast, the thing is, if if they try to get everyone to do a set visit, there are so many sort of fans out there. There are so many podcasts or, or, or um, forums or stuff like that, that it would just be too many. And mm. so that's the, the clear reason why. But I do think Eon is missing an almost fan marketing branch in terms of you know you see these t-shirts on on ebay or whatever with um oric enterprises or or drax industries they could so do a proper official licensed eon clothing with every single sort of company that's mentioned in in the bond world you know that they would make millions from it because i know every bond fan would 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 be you know screaming to do something that something else that tom and i talked a lot about is conventions you have comic con every everywhere you have marvel and star wars everywhere and yet with bond it just doesn't seem to happen you have obviously you've got the occasional little thing you have the bond in motion which is a few obviously a few vehicles but it's not something where bond fans can go to express their love like like a convention and it, I, for me it's screaming out there it, i don't know why well i kind of know why it's not happened but i really think there is a lot of scope for that sort of thing to happen like uh, you know, I, just imagine going to a massive um, sort of convention where you could you could even bring the kids along if they do sort of face painting like Baron Samedi or something like that. I don't know, but you could have like potential like, alumni from the film. You have to be careful with the Baron Samedi. <laughs> no, that's true. That's a potential. Right, you don't have children, do you? I'm just going to go right, out and live here. Scrub that. But um, you could have obviously people doing the gun barrel. You could have like M's office. You could have all the different sets. Um, you could have um sort of the miniature toys of Atlantis, maybe if, if for stuff for the younger audience, and you could really mix it up, and um maybe some of the alumni doing chats and stuff like that, and I think that's the really big thing that's missing um from from the fan community, and there's something else that we've touched on a lot recently as well is that because there's such big gaps between the films now, it's almost like it's skipping a generation or, you know, back when we were sort of watching the Bond, you'd get them every couple of years, maybe every three years at the most. And it's taken such a long time now. And again, there are understandable reasons why, but if if they had sort of things that could uh, sort of branch that, like we mentioned the whole Lego thing recently, obviously you've got the Aston Martin DB5. Imagine a Lego Bond movie, you know, that's a way that you could get kids into Bond. And then that sort of, teasing them at the start isn't it okay so this is what bond's about and as they grow up you can like feed them little bits of you know introduce them to some of the lighter hearted films all the way forward and that's something that star wars has and marvel has but bond doesn't and i think there's definitely scope for that sort of thing out there 
But Chris, not a Muppet movie? Well, I'm, no. No, I'm, I'm down for the Muppet movie. I'm down for the Muppet movie. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that is the worry. Yeah. We, like I said, we spoke about it recently, is that the kids are going to go to Star Wars and Marvel these days. And there's so much content for them out there. And it's a different world now as well. Everybody's on their phone doing stuff. And there's there's games and apps and God knows what else. And, and you know, there's you stick on Netflix and there's Marvel series on there. And there's always something pumping away. And I know that you don't have the same scope for that with Bond because it's one character versus a whole universe of characters. But that, you know, a Lego Bond movie series is a perfect example of something that would, would not cross over into the real Bond movies at all, but would be perfect for the kids. Or an old, mm. like the, the 90s Batman animated series from the 90s. That was so cool, man. Like you could do yeah. you could do that with Bond or, or do the original Fleming stories or something like yeah. that. There is scope for so much more. And I just do worry, like you step, like Chris just said, you walk into a Comic-Con and there's no sign of Bond anywhere. There's literally everything but yeah. Bond. And I think there's a real danger of Bond slipping away with the with the current generation coming through. I think you just, it needs to be more than just a series of films now to keep mm. up. Yeah. Well, well I'm going to, yeah. I, I actually think change is in the air, gents. Mm. I really do. I mean, I think that, First of all, I think Eon, their PR group, which there's a lot of new individuals within their PR group, are much more embracing. But when I say fan, I mean influencer marketing in a, in a term from these are the individuals who think of it like a grenade effect. You know, when they talk and when they engage, it's shrapnel and it goes out to a wider, wider group of people. And I think they're getting really, really smart and intelligent because they are going to have a series of events, obviously leading to the film and beyond, but they also know that there's a lot of brands that are going to be having more events. So in the past, Heineken and Belvedere would have events in and around the premiere. They're going to start much earlier. You know, all of our brown, you saw the shorts mm. and whatever you feel about those, they're <laughs> going to have a series of events globally for their particular brand. And it goes, I mean, Hackett of London, it's just going to go on and on and on. So I will agree with you wholeheartedly that I think not to in the distant past, they kept fans almost like this strange animal in the zoo. It's like, ooh, it's kind of scary, but I'm glad there's bars and you know, I don't want to get them too close. But, you know, you got to go to the zoo and see the vampire bats. But I think that they are actually starting to see, my gosh, there are certain individuals that, number one, connect with the brand lifestyle, but also connect with the, like you, you two were painting, the positive effect of creating a community of like-minded individuals. So I think you're going to see some some new waves of engagement. Oh, that sounds yeah. very good. I'm I'm big time up for that. That sounds great. Definitely. It might be fun. Yeah. 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 All right, guys. Does. Here we go. We're 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 into the last question, <laughs> but it's a biggie. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So I know the two of you must get off the podcast and 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 talk and say, you know, this was great. You know, look what we did here, and this was something new. But is there a vision? For JBR that you have that is either evolutionary, transformational. In other words, what we see today, will it be changing? Is there is there a bigger vision? It doesn't even need to be bigger. Is there a different vision? Where do you want to go? Go on, Chris. I'll let I you think, take that one. Yeah. Well, I think definitely along a similar path, but just expanding. Just keep keep growing with the listeners. I mean, it, it grows every week in terms of the number of listeners that we have on or the number of uh, viewers on on YouTube. So just just to try and expand and get the word out there and um, get as many people on that global map as we can, not purely from a pride point of view, but purely because the more people that listen, the more people are aware of other Bond fans, and then there's more chance of these communities growing and, and the Bond family becoming as one, uh, which is a bit cheesy, but it's actually, I think that's a really good sort of, you know, that's a good, if they, if we can pull off, you know, stuff like that, then, then we're heading in the right direction, I think. So for me, hopefully more of that side of things is is definitely where we're heading and we've we've kind of expanded a little bit so in terms of we're doing a few tours sort of to some of the locations so so we get there are some sort of regular people that come along to that but always nice to see some new faces so we do a bit of that as well uh, and expanding into into one or two other areas so um yeah ultimately just growing as a community i think um and then hopefully like tom said one day we, we get that little call to come to a press junket or, or whatever it is or 
uh, I tell you what, one of the things that we'd love is just even to be a background extra in a Bond film, but oh, you yes. know, just, even, just to get your face. For instance, you know, yeah, sweeping, you know, yeah, you're sweeping, but actually on the ground. But you know that a scene in um in Spectre where he he sort of parachutes off, off the car, the uh, US goes in, and then as he comes down to land, there's just that sort of guy. Just something like that, you know, just a little bit random, but you're on the screen for like two or three minutes, but you can see it's you, and then you're immortalised in Bond history. That's Is the that dream too much right to there. ask? What do you think? <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I think, oh, yeah, that's it. I think ultimately, I think the, the, as cheesy as it sounds, the best part is when you see all these friendships kind of blossom from the shared experience of the podcast, you know, they, they meet up in real life and start forming these groups and stuff. And, um, I know some of the, uh, the JBR Philly group, uh, went on a trip to Vegas and they were, they would all had their JBR t-shirts on and they were playing the water game from diamonds are forever. That's still there at circus <laughs> circus. Um, I don't think they've changed the carpet in circus circus since they filmed diamonds are forever and all those kinds of things. And that's just, so, that's so great to see. And yeah, 100% like more of that. Um, as opposed to sort of doing different things, I feel like the podcast will more or less stay the same because it's just that's the the format that works for us, I suppose. But I think more more kind of like live events, like Chris says, tours around the locations and stuff. And you know, our fifth anniversary will be coming up early next year, so I feel like maybe some kind of live event where we all get together and do stuff that uh, that might be on the cars if we can get something together. So yeah, I, I just I, ultimately I think it all boils down to like building that sense of community and, and bringing people together around with the with the podcast is like a sort of center point that everybody knows because they listen to it having that you know all these groups is this sort of sort of little satellite groups around it and just growing that experience for everybody i guess that's so much better than global domination <laughs> so much better <laughs> putting it out there hey do you guys have uh literally five more minutes for a bonus yeah. round Ooh, yeah hit us with it go on this is exciting all right and it, i'll tell you a lot of this was fed from a conversation that happened amongst the, the group in solden and things like that and having fun with speculation so bond 25 and tom we're going to start with you keep it conjugated no more than a, maybe a minute or two uh, but what's your uh, best guess at either the plot or big events within bond 25 okay so i i think it's it, it, chris corbold said is something about that it's going to be very very special this one and to think about the olympics so to me i so i immediately re-watched the olympic short and i feel like it's either got to be some it's got to be a connection to the royals in some way whatever that is because that's the only thing that really happens in that short as outside of the olympics so i feel like I, what that is, I don't know, because everything that comes to my mind is pretty cheesy. But we know we've got, they're looking for a Russian villain and a Russian Bond girl. So I i, I feel like, I feel like we've completely gone a left turn from the whole Spectre angle. I feel like Spectre won't even be mentioned at all in Bond 25. But what it's going to be, I don't know. I would kind of like to see a return of General Gogol. You know what I mean? Whether that's whether that's him, <laughs> yeah, like a new yeah. Gogol and a new Triple X or something, like something along those lines. I feel like that's pretty much what it's going to be because the, the casting call asked for the Bond girl to have a lot of combat stuff. So I feel like it might be a similar theme to Spy Love Me where you've got, especially with the whole Russia connection now with Trump and all that kind of stuff, all that's in the news. So I feel like it's going to be quite a topical thing bond working with a russian agent against the russian villains with some kind of connection to the royals what that's going to be i don't know but i feel like that's what we're looking at yeah i think Love so well, really? well the royal connection i think it's going to be robotic corgis armed with explosives and they like send them into buckingham palace and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i heard that on the podcast i actually laughed while i was driving i have to tell you sorry about that <laughs> dangerous <Genius>. driving <laughs> um yeah no i think royal connection it, it basically prior with the purvis away script we i think we would have guaranteed to have had the specter perhaps the revenge mission or who knows you know maybe the garden of death Hodge and, and Danny Boyle obviously had this idea and everyone that knows anything about it have said it's so special, mm. you know. So, it, so it's got to be something which is a level above any of the recent Bond films. It's got to have that something extra which no one has thought about. Now, something that has been touted is potentially James Bond's death. Now, it's Daniel's last film. 
it could be that his bond goes and at the end he dies, or perhaps it could be left on the cliffhanger and he might be dead, he might not be, who knows? And that's one thing. Now, I'm not sure how I'd feel about that, but that's a potential thing. But the royal family is definitely, it has to be involved in, in one way or another, I think. Um, but yeah, when when we got the casting call and we saw the Russians, I mean, that's kind of a bit of a throwback to the old school with uh, with your octopuses and, and your living daylights and, and your From Russia With Loves and stuff like that. So... It's going to be really interesting to see to see what they do, and and this is the time, David. This is the best time where we get these little nuggets coming through. Now we're oh, going right. to get drips and drabs, and the build up between now and and the release of Bond Twenty Five is just going to be immense. It's going to it's be like, so. Good. It's like having an exposed nerve or cavity, and you don't <laughs> want to touch it with your tongue, but you keep touching it, and you're like, oh, that feels so good, but it feels terrible. The same. I love it. Maybe you guys never had that. I don't know. Uh, but all right, I'll totally let me let me see if I can blow your minds yeah. um number one i think that casting call is old yeah i think mark strong is going to be a red grant type of individual mm. i wrote the the mark strong because i've been in contact with the trainer who had that little whoopsie moment yeah. and that was a real whoopsie moment yeah. do you think i was uh, sorry tommy i'll just do a quick one the whole thing about james bond being the code name i think with 007 without a doubt that's like a code. So I think, you know, we've seen different 009s, we've seen different double O, you know, various different double O's. And I think 007 could potentially be someone else, but not obviously we couldn't have a Bond film if it wasn't. But using it as a code name or a code word, then I'd be down with that. To have James Bond itself as a name, I mean, that's been touted about, I've heard it once or twice before. And it would be, you know, it's going to take a lot of balls. I think whatever they do in Bond 25, it's going to be something really ballsy and out there, which they're, obviously they haven't done mm. before. Um, I think the death of Bond just, might be might be where they're going with it, you know, because I, I, I've got a feeling that it's the 25th Bond film. There's been a lot of talk. I remember when, obviously when you asked Daniel that question at that theatre thing in New York that you went to, do you remember? And he was, somebody asked him about the next Bond film and he said, oh, we're all just very tired. We're doing different things. I've got a feeling that after Bond 25 is over, Elon might consider selling to a Disney or something like that. I've just got this feeling just from what people have been saying that they're going to, you know, she's making different films nowadays and stuff. Film stars don't die in Liverpool and the, the Blake Lively one coming up and stuff. I feel like they might just be like, okay, let's, let's leave it at 25 and let somebody else take the reins. So I, I think you're right. Changes in the air in more ways than one. I think after bond 25, things are going to be very different in every possible way. I think it's going to be a big wait for bond. 26 i don't think it's going to happen straight away um I, I agree. yeah and and i think maybe the death of bond at the end is the way that they sign off upon 25 and the, if they were yeah. to do it i don't want them to do it but if they were to do it i feel like the way to go would be kind of like the dark knight rises without the silly bit at the end so the way batman kind of died at the end of dark knight rises I thought was such a cool moment when it happened. And I hated the bit at the end where Bruce gives him the wink to Alfred. I was like, mm. oh, that's such yeah. an easy way out. Like they should have just let yeah. him die and it would have been so perfect. Mm. Um, I feel like I wouldn't want to see the death of Bond. I would want it. I, it would be something that big explosion in the distance and he couldn't possibly have escaped. And then you see the aftermath of it. I think that's the way I would want to see it done. I wouldn't want to see him bleeding out on the floor or something. Um, right. And then it, 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 the, the, that moment being this sort of like poignant send off, but then that would be one hell of a downer to leave it on as well. So I, I don't, I don't think that's what we're going to get, but, no. but maybe because there's definitely something about this film that's different. I, I just, I guess I gravitate to the, to the business side of things and yeah. For them, if they do want to sell the Bond franchise, for them to kill Bond off, to me, I think it, it might devalue mm. the the franchise mm. a little bit. I, I, I hear you. I think I think first of all, it's a great way to entice Daniel Craig back, Craig Craig mm. back <laughs> because um, they they had to do that with Harrison Ford, for example, in Force Awakens. Like, hey, you're going to die. Mm. You know, Han Solo is going to die, and that was part of his stipulation. But I think that. I don't know. I just think of it from a business standpoint. But again, this is the wonderful part because it's all speculative. Yeah. So well, yeah. what is your take, David? Just quickly turning the tables on you. If, if Eon, do you think a, um, if Eon continue, all of the um, workload will shift to, to um, Greg, uh, 
you know, in the coming years, do you think he, he'll become sort of the head of Vion? Or I mean, Barbara's still got a good few years left in her. She could definitely continue. And what what would your opinion be if they did decide to sell to like a, a big conglomerate? Would you be down with that, or do you think no, stick with Vion, keep it going? Yeah. So, I mean, I think they've done a, a wonderful job. I mean, there's a nostalgic part of me that says it'd be great to keep somebody in the family. And I think even if they did sell it, there'd be a stipulation with, with a lot of these uh, corporate sellouts. You have some, um, and that sounded negative, but it's not, you have some percentage of retainership of ownership. So let's say even 7% would be retained by Dan Jack and Eon. So I could see, you know, a Greg Wilson or somebody like you mentioned, one of the younger brands being there. I think he might be uh, somewhat of a figurehead. I'm hoping he'll be more. I hear he's incredibly smart and innovative, so that would be great. Um, so invite me to the set. <laughs> um, but but I would absolutely embrace you know a Disney or somebody else getting the Bond franchise. Mm -hmm. I think they would do a lot with the marketing. Mm -hmm. I think they would do a lot of things for the fans and people that when there isn't a movie going on, mm. I think they do a lot of things with TV and all these things and Muppet movies. And I, I think they would embrace it wholeheartedly. Whereas Eon, they're incredibly careful to the point where five or six years we're getting a movie. Yeah. I think that's the thing. If, if you had someone like a Disney or, or something similar taking over Bond, you'd be guaranteed a film every two to three years. Guaranteed. Definitely. Yeah. Um, which, which, which obviously we're not getting at the moment. I'm just hoping, I mean, you know, there is, it is going to be a big change after Bond 25, but whatever happens, I just hope somehow they get back into a bit of a rhythm of two to three years. We know we're getting one. The longer that goes on to like the four years upwards, it's, it's, it's going to be tricky, I think, to, to keep, um, you know, as fans, we're never going to not like Bond, but it, it will get harder and harder to bring in other fans, I think, if, if there are such long gaps between them, perhaps. Agreed. Agreed. Well, gents, listen, first of all, thank you for spending the better powder of an hour together. This is great. I mean, hopefully, I know I have, but hopefully uh, the viewers have gotten to know you a, a little bit better. I think they have. A lot of controversial things were said that we're not going to edit out. <laughs> a lot of swear words, a lot of nudity. So I appreciate no that. Worries. Um, but really thank you for the time. And we're going to be continuing to listen. And a part of this was my passion with JBR and in my interest, but a lot was because, you know, you're definitely being heralded um, in the top influencers of, of this wonderful, small, but hopefully important community that we have. So thank oh, you. Sweet. Thank you for having us. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. It really has, David. Yeah, it's been great fun as well. I've just got to say as well, Ben, I've been watching your videos on YouTube for years. And I, I remember one of the first ones I stumbled across, you were um, you were basically just tr basically wearing all the gear and stuff and giving a tour of the basement and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I, what I love about this dude is the fact that he goes all in. He's not messing about. He's got literally his whole basement kitted out with Bond stuff. He's dressed head to toe in Bond stuff. He's got the watch on. He's got the car now. Like, you're not messing about, man. So I salute you for that. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. I, like you guys, I only know how to do it one way, and it's my passion, and it's great to share it with others. So. Definitely. All right, gents. Well, this has been, obviously, uh, Tom and Chris from JBR and David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience, and we will see you all very soon. Take care. Oh, hey, you're still here. Hi. Hey. Didn't even know. Uh, you listen, while you're here, uh, if you want, I, I, so I would actually go to this button right here and click on it because then you actually subscribe to our vlogs. It's amazing. Um, you get to see all the upcoming stuff first. You get notifications. It screams at you while you're at work. It's absolutely amazing. Just click on this button, hit subscribe. Just move your cursor, move, 